Hey everyone, it's good to see everyone here on a Friday night. I know that um, we've never done this online uh, and it, it's the first time and hopefully the last, but in, in terms of the times we're in during this pandemic, it requires us to do uh, worship online, uh, especially Good Friday. And I, I just thank you that you're able to tune in with us to be able to set aside this time, this time we call Good Friday, which is the pinnacle of Jesus' ministry, of his death, his crucifixion, and what that really means for us. And what I want this night to be about is, as we reflect on the crucifixion of Jesus, there's a theme that I have in mind that Jesus says, uh, that he says, out of the heart, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. And during this time of pandemic, I feel like you're either people have a lot of opinions coming out of their mouths, what to do, the analysis of everything. Or maybe you're on the other spectrum where you're left absolutely speechless. Regardless of what spectrum you find yourself on, your mouths are speaking, your mouths are doing something. And it says something about our hearts. What is it reflecting? What is it projecting? As I think about the crucifixion and the last couple of hours leading up to Jesus' death, I, I focus in on mouths. What is it doing? And there's a couple of images I want us to really focus on. One being, the first, one, first image being kiss. There's a kiss that's made. Second being words of testimony. What do our lips speak of in testimony? Third, I see this image of being spat on, spit out of the mouth. And the last two images are the images of thirst and the last breath. As we key in and focus in on, on these images, it's going to really reveal uh, how can we relate to this crucifixion that we, that we commemorate today in a sense. And I really want us to reflect on our own hearts. How do our hearts, our own lives reflect to the death of Jesus? And so what's gonna happen is, I'll throw out four sermons or sermonettes to really focus and uh, reflect on Jesus' death here. And as you do that, I'll throw out a couple of prayer topics. And after these uh, sermonettes, what's gonna happen is Steve is gonna come in and play the guitar, a couple praise songs. And during that time, you're either free to join along with the praise or to pray. Either way, I just really want us to all reflect together the meaning of Christ's death on the cross for us. And so with, uh, without further ado, let me go in and pray for us, opening, up, opening us up with this time. Let's all pray together. Uh, Father God, uh, we all come here, uh, I think we all come here with heavy hearts, least to say. Uh, on the one hand, we find ourselves in a pandemic that's been wreaking havoc in all of our lives. And then there's the other factor, it's Good Friday, a day of the darkest moment of history to see the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus. How do we make sense of all this? Especially as I'm sure that all of our hearts find ourselves in, in turmoil of some kinds and sorts. But we pray, Father, that you're able to use the darkest moments to be able to shine the light and the hope that we can find in Jesus. That if you use a crucifixion for our salvation, then surely, Lord, Surely everything else that we can go through that we find dark has a light of hope in it because of who Jesus really is to us. And so, Father, whether we're watching by ourselves, tuning in, whatever we're going through, draw near to us as we spend this moment reflecting on the crucifixion of Jesus. Be with us now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Chapter 22, verse 47 through 62. Here's how it reads for us. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to kiss to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around saw him, what would follow? That they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out against uh, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When was I with you day after day in the temple? You did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was with him, but he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed and the Lord turned around and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord how he had said to him before the rooster crows today you will deny me three times and he went out and wept bitterly that picture you just saw it, it, it was painted by a man named Giotto and the painting that he, he uh, that he painted is entitled the betrayal of Jesus or better yet the kiss of Judas. I'm not an art critic, but what stands out about this painting is that there seems to be these two opposing forces between good versus evil. Evil on the right side, 
with Judas le leading an angry mob of soldiers. A and to the left is Jesus and his faithful disciples. It's a clash between good and evil. But within this clash, it's not of clanging of swords, but with a kiss. That's confusing. Why not just point out Jesus? Why not just point him out to the soldiers? There he is. That's the one. Take him away. At this point, there's no reason to pretend to be friends with Jesus. Why? So why would Judas kiss Jesus? And that's what Jesus calls him out for, verse 48. Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Why use such an intimate, uh, intimate gesture of embrace when one's heart is already set on evil? Just maybe the kiss itself is a realization that, that good and evil is not as black and white as we like to believe it. Or as Jeremiah 17, 9 puts it, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That perhaps sin distorts the lines of what is good and evil. See, the thing that always bothers me about this betrayal is Peter's role. He, he comes to Jesus' side with his dagger in hand to fend off all the soldiers. Here his, is his moment to, to really back up his words when he told Jesus, Jesus, I will die for you. I believe it in this moment. You really believe it when he said it back then, and you especially believe it now. And yet Jesus tells him, put your sword away. Jesus didn't need Peter to die for him. Instead, Jesus needed to die for Peter. All Peter needed to do was to believe. And yet, a couple hours later, Peter is tested. Weren't you with Jesus? No. Are you sure? Aren't you one of his disciples? No. Do you know Jesus? No. Pretty much, the entire summation of all these questions really should have resonated within Peter's mind as just one question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of your life? No. The heart is deceitful. Who can understand it? Judas is painted and known as the betrayer, but Peter, on the other hand, he's known as the denier. It's okay to see yourself in Peter, but not in Judas, because with Judas, he is evil. He is the bad guy. But Peter, on the other hand, he's relatable. He's human. We can all see ourselves doing what Peter did. And as a result, we see Judas as this ultimate antagonist. But in reality, we should see it more as a reflection. There's not much that separates the denial of Peter and the betrayal of Judas. Because all sin is a denial or betrayal of Jesus, no matter how you want to nuance it. Why is it that Judas is condemned and Peter is forgiven. It's all about the responses. Judas feels bad about what he did. I'm pretty sure he's convicted by what he did. So he tries to give back the 30 pieces of silver that he sold Jesus out for. Judas tries to basically make up for it, make atonement for himself. That's when you start to see the reflection. We like to intellectualize why we've done something. I, I was tired. I was fatigued. I was under a lot of pressure. There was a lot of stress. People were lying to me, this and that. 
we intellectualize our sins. Or we shift the blame, attribute partial blame for, for the wrongs that have happened in our lives. That's exactly what Peter, or that's exactly what Judas does. But Peter, he weeps bitterly. That's what it says. He weeps bitterly. He's less concerned about how to make up for his sin and simply broken that he denied Jesus. He's helpless only to be at the mercy of Jesus. Will he forgive me? It's the first time in Peter's life that he felt like there was nothing he could do but simply hope and trust that Jesus would be merciful towards him. As we reflect on both Judas and Peter, here's what I want us to do. The heart is deceitful. Who can really understand it? I don't know about you, there's a lot of things that I feel like is wrong in my heart, especially during this time of pandemic. Why not take this time to gently repent, to seek forgiveness, we don't have to wonder whether God is merciful or not. We know that he is. Is it possible that the lack of revival within our church and within our own lives is simply because of the fact that we try to atone for ourselves rather than to be helpless, rather than to come like Peter, broken, weeping bitterly over our sins? Take this time to reflect. In what ways do you nuance your betrayals towards Jesus or your denials? Confess them before him and know that his heart towards us is to restore us. Let's take this time to repent. You can take the whole entire time to pray or to sing along with Steve, that's fine. But I want you to reflect on this. The heart is deceitful. Who can understand it? The Lord does understand it, and yet He could still bring healing into it. As I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I hear you call, Father, you worked your As I had no righteousness of my own, I had no right to draw near your throne. Father, you loved me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost Jesus, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone Jesus, you paid my debt It's by your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown and you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night Spirit you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone 
Spirit, you moved in me. At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. On my dark and are the light of Christ has shown. It's called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven citizen by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. As I will run the race by grace and grace alone. As I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 57 through 68, and then we'll skip on over to chapter 27, verse 11 through 14. Here's how it reads for us. Then those who had, who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat down with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And as the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He uttered blasphemy. What further witness do you need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, He deserves death. And they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Flipping over to uh, 27 verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate uh, said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Those sketches you just saw, they're, they're sketches of high-profile court cases. And you would think that the technology of high-definition cameras will make courtroom sketches a dying breed. But sketches are still drawn, and it's the cameras that are typically banned. Because when the, the weight and the balance of guilty and innocent hang, the videos and the sound of shutters are distraction. And it's the artist who quietly observes, interprets, captures the mood of the courtroom drama with just one single sketch. Jesus enters two courtrooms. One with the Sanhedrin, the most powerful Jewish council, and the other, a Roman government. What would the sketch look like here? What would be the single mood that captures all this? In each tri trial, I think there's just one verse that captures the entire mood for each case. Accusations, assumptions are made, and with the Sanhedrin, they use their words not to find out the truth, not to clarify, but to destroy. And even then, as they bring accusations after, after accusations, Jesus is still innocent. How innocent do you have to be to, that even false accusations don't even stick? It goes to show us Jesus was sinless, perfect in all his ways. So what is, the, what is the Sanhedrin really bothered by? And here's the single mood. Verse 63. Verse 63, here's how it reads. 
But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Here's what they're bothered by. Jesus is God. That's what sets them off. Because this God, Jesus, is about to introduce grace and grace completely undermines the religion of self-made men, especially devout religious ones. In the minds of the Sanhedrin, their main motto was, if you do right, then God will be right with you. To do wrong is judgment. Yet grace that Jesus was offering is that everyone is dead in their sin. But the free gift of grace is for anyone who believes that only Jesus can make us right with God. And the self-made men cry out, blasphemy, absolute blasphemy. Jesus was about to flip upside down everything they worked hard for. To do right is to be right with God. They had rules for everything, rules for the temple, rules for taxes, rules for working, rules for resting, rules on top of rules on top of rules. I've always found the rules of washing, purification a bit odd. The idea that cleansing ourselves with water can somehow purify the soul, make us right with God. But in a pandemic, washing hands has become my ritual. I've been ceaselessly washing my hands to the point where they're dried and they, they get raw and the cracks start to form on my skin. Anytime I start to rub and apply Purell, it stings. And every time I feel this sensation, I wonder to myself, how much longer am I supposed to live like this? In paranoia, uncertainty, anxiety, and whatever else a pandemic is supposed to bring. Jews wash their hands to be right with God but I realize I've been washing mind, thinking, God has to be right with me. Just like that, I'm in the company of self-made men. What kind of God allows pandemics to completely dismantle everything I work hard for? How can this be God? They send Jesus to another trial interrogated by the Roman government. And what does Pontius Pilate care about? What's the single mood that captures his courtroom scene? It's simply this, verse 11. Are you the king of the Jews? Are you a king? All hail Caesar. All things Rome. Don't disrupt how we do our politics. Don't disrupt our economy. Don't disrupt our way of living. Only Caesar reigns. There is no room for another king. We have a good thing going on here. Don't mess it up. In this kingdom, there's just room for one king. But Jesus isn't asking for room. He is Lord over everything, including a pandemic that has disrupt disrupted our tiny little kingdoms. The accusations say less about Jesus and more about what is in the heart of man. As we reflect on this, what complaints, what arguments, accusations do you bring against God? There's gotta be something you can't understand, something that bothers you. Pray your hearts out at this time about these things to the Lord. And at the end of this, what you cannot know or understand, the things that you just don't understand. Pray that he will still, that Jesus will still be Lord over your life and that he will lead you. Take this time to pray and reflect. Show me how much you love
Spirit be the star that leads me to the humble heart of love I see in you. So now one more time, I'll kneel me down. chapter 15 verse 16 through 32 and here's how it reads for us and the soldiers led him away inside the palace that is the governor's headquarters and they called together the whole battalion and they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns they put it on him and they began to salute him hail king of the jews and they were striking his head with the reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him 
And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each would take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. And also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others and he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. That image you just saw, it's a crowd witnessing a lynching, the lynching of Emmett Till. And this is perhaps, this idea of lynching is perhaps one of the darkest moments in our country's past. And on February 26, 2020 of this year, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was officially passed. Lynching is now a federal crime. It took 120 years to finally come to the conclusion that lynching is inhumane. I mean, what took so long? Attached to this image are, are, are words like barbaric, senseless, uh, hatred, racist, evil. But the worst aspect of this is it's dehumanizing for everyone that's involved. To strip someone of all their dignity, to dangle it on a rope. It's the closest thing we know to understand a crucifixion, the darkest form of all humiliation. After Jesus received his sentence, the soldiers dress him, make him play pretend king, in pretend king's clothing, they beat him with a stick and they spit on him. It's demeaning. If Jesus is already going to, going to be crucified, why on earth in God's sovereign plan would he allow Jesus to endure these petty forms of humiliation? Because Jesus' humiliation is not solely based on how he died but also everything in between from his birth to his death that Jesus relates to us even in our small moments where we feel small and spat upon when we received racial slurs for how we looked different embarrassed that we can't afford a certain kind of lifestyle unwelcome because we can't fit into certain social circles Feeling our age, what we once could do with ease now becomes a challenge. Life is full of moments where we feel spit upon. Just not big enough for us to want us to end our lives, but demeaning and petty enough to grab our attention, harden us little by little, where we say to ourselves, I'm never going to let this happen again. The real wound of our humiliation is not really what's done to us, but what we fail to do for ourselves, to feel helpless. After being beaten and spit upon, Jesus carries the cross, but on the way, they command Simon of Cyrene in verse 21 to help Jesus carry the cross. Let that sink in for you. Jesus, who is sent to save us, needs help carrying the cross. I mean, in all these movies, the, the superstar, even when they're down to their last breath, they somehow muster enough strength to come back and win and save the day. But not with Jesus. Jesus needs someone else to help carry the cross for him. We don't like to admit that we need help. And if we do, it's only because we know we can still do our part. In this time of pandemic, all these charities are out there trying to help millions of people who need it. 
And these people, they come needing help. And one of the things that the organizers noticed about people who ask for help is how apologetic they sound. Hey, I'm sorry, but I need help paying the rent this month. I'm sorry, but do you think you can help me with groceries? I'm sorry, but can you help me? I'm sorry. As if self-sufficiency is the norm and help is just supposed to be an anomaly. But if there's anything that a crucifixion and pandemic reveal is that we are all helpless and that's always been the case. As they crucify Jesus on a cross, look what they mock him with in verse 30. Save yourself, come down from the cross. He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Translation, Jesus, why are you so helpless? You wanna know why? Jesus remains helpless on a cross so that you would know where your help actually comes from. The Lord is our helper. That as God the Father left Jesus helpless on a cross, it was a reminder that God will be our very help in time of need, in times of trouble. He knows that you and I are helpless because no matter how hard you try, you cannot save yourself especially from sin and death. And if you cannot save yourself, then surely you cannot sustain yourself. You can be helpless because God promises to be your helper. That's what the cross reminds us of. As we reflect upon this, what are you embarrassed by? What makes you feel like you're being spit upon? What's the humiliation that you face on a day-to-day -day basis? Pray these things out, knowing that there, there's a sympathetic God that wants to hear and listen to all this. And once you're done with that, what do you feel helpless about at this time? What makes you really feel helpless? Cry out to the Lord because he is your helper and he will sustain you. As you reflect upon this, Pray with me about these things. I tasted the world, seen more than enough. Its promise is fleeting of water and
John chapter 19, verse 28 through 30, and here's how it reads for us. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it out to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It's a... Uh, Hard to believe that the image that you just saw just happened five years ago, where we witnessed Flint, Michigan's water being poisoned. 6,000 to 12,000 kids exposed to lead. You can't shower, you couldn't wash your clothes, and most essentially, you can't drink the water. How do you survive without clean water? It's as essential to us as breathing air. And yet five years later, after reconstructing the pipes and filtering out all the gunk, the pronouncement was made. It's safe to drink the water again. But people are hesitant. And I don't blame them. I can imagine all of us feeling the same way after the pandemic, if it ever ends. It's safe to go out again. Business as usual. But can anyone ever promise that things will be the same? Towards Jesus' dying breath, the, the last feeling that he has, if I can even call it that, is, I thirst. At this point, can you feel anything? Nails through hands and feet, a crown of thorns wrapped around his head, lungs failing in the shortness of breath, trauma from all the beating, significant loss of blood. How does anyone feel thirsty at this point? Yet perhaps maybe the thirst that Jesus felt goes beyond the parched throat, but more has to do with what John says, that scripture must be fulfilled. That the thirst that Jesus expresses is to do the will of his Father. That to have God is more important than water itself. I thirst. Our day-to-day -day struggle in our lives is not from what we lack but instead is that we have too much. In the plethora of experiences we desire to have, occupations we desire to, uh, we desire to pursue, uh, the stuff we desire to possess, uh, the information at the tips of our fingers, we consume all of this, where our version of thirsting really looks a lot more like drowning. We forget that we need God more than anything else. And as Jesus fulfilled God's will, it says for Jesus in verse 30, how he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Notice, Jesus gave up his spirit, pneuma, also the same word for breath. No one took it away from him, but he freely gave it up. A selfless gesture for a world drowning in its selfishness. He gave up his last breath so that you and I can breathe, knowing that we have the love of God, where neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Breathe easy, friends. He will not let you go thirsty. He will not let you drown. And he will not let go of you so that you can let go of what you think is important for you. As we reflect on this, <coughs> reflect on what Jesus has done. Let's pray for a couple of things. Let's pray that what we thirst more for is more than the earthly goods, the earthly desires. 
but to desire God himself more and more. Let's pray as a church that what remains front and center is Jesus himself. That the hope of our church at Hope Presbyterian Church is Christ in us, Christ in you. And that would be what shines. And after we pray for those things, can we also pray that God will constantly shape disciples within our church? That we would constantly look at what does it really mean to be more like Christ? What does it really mean to die to ourselves and live for Jesus? As we reflect on these, can you pray them with me as well?
think that concludes our Good Friday service. Thank you for joining us and reflecting on, on what Jesus' crucifixion really means for all of us. And as, we, as I close us out in prayer, I also want to welcome you that after this time, we're all going to meet on Zoom uh, to, uh, to pray for one another. And so if you do have time at 8.30, we're all going to gather together on Zoom. The link should be posted on Facebook groups. And so if you want to join us and pray together with us, uh, come. I, I encourage you. Whereas on Good Friday, the disciples fled and left. What we want to do is the opposite. We want to band together and pray for one another, whatever struggles and joys that we share. And so let me go ahead and close us in prayer for the night. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, I know it's been a long night, a long week for a lot of us, but I thank you that you sustained us nonetheless to be here, to spend time at the feet of Jesus, to be reminded that what makes Good Friday good is that in the darkest moment of history, in Jesus' last breath, we are given new life. Lord, if you're able to make light shine out of this kind of darkness, how much more so within a pandemic, how much more so in our own lives? God, will we not treat the things of, of your miraculous workings and powers small, but instead may we become smaller that Christ may increase in us. Jesus, we thank you for everything that you have done for us. May we count it precious, pure gold. Refine us to see it that way. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.